am recording that... now, so any future does... disagreements will be documented. Does that mean that I'm choosing to say something incorrectly when I say artificer? Because I have learned that factually it's art artificer, which sounds awful, and I don't like oh, how it sounds. Dumb. Uh, uh, artificer. Sigil. It's, it's artificer. It should just be artificer. You're Sigil right. Sigil no. versus sigil. I think it is helpful that they are pronounced differently because they are different things, right? So sigil, man, I'm going to get confused, is is the thing you write down. It's the rune, right? It's, it is a thing that is a, is a pictogram, if you will. Whereas sigil is a different word in my brain, and therefore I can use it to denote a location because you could be in sigil and see a sigil, and otherwise that would be very confusing. The sigil and sigil signifies oh, the God. symbol. I hate uh, that. <laughs> Listen, welcome. <laughs> I'm DJ. And I'm Andrew. Welcome to One Shot Tavern, a TTRPG podcast where we seek out new ways to tell your stories through different systems and games, and sometimes we argue about really, really dumb shit for fun. Um, today we are taking things a little bit more casual, um, and we're talking about disagreements, uh, that are kind of been popping off in this space. Um, not specifically the sigil, sigil conversation or artificer, artificier, artificer, gif, 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 all that. Yeah. Um, but lately a hot topic on the TikToks, there's been a lot of them because I, and, and <laughs> yes. to be fair, I think that's been mostly a civil dif discourse that I've appreciated, but n not entirely. Um, what's that hot topic, DJ? Uh, the hot topic this week is, well, recently is, uh, do you fudge dice? And is it okay to lie to your players? You're uh, an abusive DM if you fudge. Essentially. No. So like, like, th that's been the conversation, right? Okay, let's define it first. To fudge dice as a dungeon master, a game master, person running the game, um, is to literally tell your players a different result that, than what you rolled on the dice. Good it or is, bad. It is, for whatever reason, for whatever method, it is at its core, I would say, um, a uh, L-I-E. It is. Like, right. it is It is a, if, a bluff. Yes a white lie, whatever you want to define it as, it is giving false information to your players. Um, now, if we take this away from the fudging dice thing really quick, I do believe there are appropriate times in a game, in the setting, to give false information to the players. That's Absolutely. interesting. That's fun. Um, but also because, like, not, like, just because they asked for something. Yeah. Uh, right? Just because they rolled really high. Yeah doesn't mean that narratively it makes sense that they're going to have all the information that they want to have out of it. So let's um, start with a question, yeah. DJ. Have you or do you fudge dice? Um, In the past... Polygraph is sure. on. Right. In the past, uh, you know, before growing as a game master and storyteller, yeah, you know, it's... Deflection. One of those yes things no. where it's... Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, no. Uh, yeah. I haven't fudged dice in, in years because uh, I don't really see the need to. Mm -hmm. uh, also, yeah. a big nuance that we're not pointing out here is there's a lot of games the Dungeon Master does not roll dice. Roll so dice, we are yes. definitely talking mostly about games where that is a mechanic of the game. Uh, as you know, the a Pathfinders, frequent, the D&Ds. Yeah, as frequent uh, Cypher game masters, uh, we have the benefit of of not doing that. Also. To that point, I think that's what broke me of the very infrequent habit I had of fudging dice. I think that the argument that I would have made years ago is, let's say we're in a boss fight, right? Big dramatic moment. This is not just a boss fight where I have a cool monster right. that I want to hit them with. I have the tied BBG. story into this. This is important to a person's backstory like all this stuff is happening like i really like i like for this narrative reason i need to compel the barbarian to go pull this lever and not be able to attack me in one hit kill me right so like it's it's the equivalent of i need to force a monologue yeah that's a good example yeah. i'm going to time stop and everybody's going to fail their saves or whatever and blah 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 and i'm going to force that to happen so that i can monologue um don't get me wrong. I love a monologue. I get it. 
but in in inherently that is it's very me centric as a game master to try and push that onto my players and to subvert what they otherwise accept as the rules of their universe right so if Absolutely. they get hit with a spell they know they can make a save or to some effect right uh they know that if they attack me and i have to make a save that i'm following those same rules um this whole conversation can be summarized in have a session zero and talk about fudging dice. Let's just be very clear. If your players are fine with you deciding to change the result of a dice in a moment of drama and, and you can define what are the, the qualifications for when dice can be fudged, you know what? Go for it. That's fine. We're not here to tell you whether or not to do it, but we do I want... Am. Don't do it. I would recommend not doing it. Um, I did it for what felt like the right reasons for a very long time. Um, yeah. I didn't do it a lot, but I always felt justified when I did it. Yeah, and it's one of those things where it's like, um, I actually talked about this uh, with in my interview with uh, Classic Sam uh, NYGM, where there is a point where you're as a game master, especially early on, that you have planned things to the letter, right? You've, you've, you're like, this needs to happen. This needs to happen. This conversation needs to happen. These words must be spoken. All of that. And the problem with that is, uh, well, players are chaotic and players are going to gravitate towards what they gravitate towards. And so when you fudge dice, it's it's you saying, no, I know what's right for these players often, right? Um, I can understand fudging the other way where, say, you get a, you know, uh, your barbarian gets an absolute crazy hit in, right? Just lays that hammer down. It's a natural 20 They've described it beautifully, and your BBEG has three hit points left. It's okay, in my opinion, to say those three hit points are gone, right? If it if it's more satisfying and fun, because what if for a whole other round, your players are like, "Oh, we're missing. Oh, we're missing. Oh man, it's so." And then. It can it can drag and it ruins the momentum of the the fight. It takes away the accomplishment and it's like ah. But on the end where it's like oh uh, I rolled my dice and it's like oh that's a uh, natural one. That's a natural twenty, right? It's like yeah. you're artificially throw like it becomes less of a game at that point in my opinion. So the reason why. We are not just playing improv is because we've accepted rules in the game we're playing, right? We've accepted that yeah. there are rules and rule of cool exists, but to become the arbiter of cool as the, as the game master without the explicit consent of your players, I would say is a little, not morally gray anymore. It's yeah. not, it's not gray anymore. You're in the black. And um, I I would just caution you against it. So, like, if if I were to summarize this episode before we really get into it anymore, um, you should be talking to your players about this. If you've ever remotely considered fudging your dice, you should have an open and honest conversation about yeah. it with them. Now, that let me let me be clear. I think DJ knows this for me, right? So let's take the hit points. So this isn't fudging dice, but this would be a little bit a different but parallel subject. I will confidently, in the favor of the players only, fudge, to your example, if there's a couple hit points left and you just did an amazingly cool hit where you did 80 points of damage and he's got two hit points left, he's dead in my book. Right. Right? Like, I could, I can, and, and narratively, let's, let's, let's look at that. If you have two hit points and you started out with like 200, you feel like crap. You yeah. might want to run away and, and maybe you don't run them away, but you know what I mean? Like you might fall to the ground, start pleading for mercy. The fight can be over is kind of the, the point that I'm getting to. 
And that is in the favor of the players. That is because a player did something so damn cool. And then now that awesome moment is at risk of, of maybe not being as valuable or the very next person shooting off one cantrip and getting the kill. Yeah. And that feeling bad. Um, how now, many how many bad guys have 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 succumbed to magic missile as the last attack just yeah. because it was a guaranteed hit? Yeah. And and there's a lot of other cues that are like these pseudo nonverbal things that we play with at the table. At least we have, and I know it's common in like Critical Role and in a lot of other actual plays. And it is um, in the absence of the bloodied condition in D and D Fifth Edition, we say. He's not looking too pretty, or, oh yeah, he's he's re really smart. Or what is what's the most common term for this? I'm missing it. Um, uh, for me, it's it's always just he's not he's really not looking good. Yeah, exactly. So that's well, if you say it like that in my book, that means twenty five percent or less, right? Like that's yeah. that's that window. So these are these social uh, forms of communication where we're subbing out a game mechanic and we're saying i want to i want to tell you where we're at players without telling yeah. you exactly where we're at in in absence of a actual health bar you know like let's figure this out um okay i want to rewind to how i used to 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 play stuff and and something i sometimes miss because it was weird and interesting and i thought it was normal when i started playing games and you'll remember this we played on a whiteboard. Yes, we did. So our tabletop was a big old whiteboard that I had taken a knife and I had drawn in Carved all into. of the grid lines because if you use Sharpie and then you use white erase, it actually removes the Sharpie and all this yep. stuff. So I'm like, okay, I'll just carve lines into it. Worked great. What did we do with that whiteboard in front of every single player? We tracked health openly. We had oh, yeah. AC. That's true. We did. And yep. players, somebody, almost like a note taker, would track damage dealt often to bad guys, individual bad guys, as well as the big bad whatever. So oh, yeah. we knew, oh, this goblin's taken six hit points. The players engaged in a meta um, conversation with the game by way of tracking things in a way that your your character wouldn't, right? This comes down to how do you run a system what kind of systems do you like to run? What's fun for your players, right? That was fun at that time. But as we moved more and more narrative focus, we got away from some of those things and it just wasn't as important. Um, I, I miss that sometimes. I loved that, like, oh my gosh, we've dealt 182 hit, uh, points of damage. Yeah, There's no way Andrew made this have 200 health. Like, we're right there. We, like, we're not going to break right. the 200 line. It was fun, yeah, yeah. So, and it was it was it was fun. It was transparent. Um, the, it's one of the things that I miss about like those old in person, yeah, you know, get togethers was terrain on a whiteboard and just writing straight on the stupid thing. Um, it it was great. Uh, it was, it was nothing right. felt hidden. Which is funny because I also didn't use a dungeon master screen back then. Yeah, um, I rolled on the table in front of everybody. Open rolls really easy uh, to get away from this problem, right? So, yeah. uh, if you've never tried open rolling, just do it for one session. Just do oh, it. It's great. See too. how it feels. It's, yeah, especially when you get as the game master, you get those like two or three like natural twenties in a few rounds, and they're they're they see it happen. Yeah. And oh man, if you're playing in person, they will lose their minds. I think, uh, I think yeah. when I, I first started playing uh, Pathfinder, I was out in Colorado with a group. We had some people, I don't even remember who it was, but we had some people that played with us that would, uh, they'd roll their dice and quickly pick it up after oh, no. they've declared their result. And it's like that at the time created a lot of distrust at the table to where, you know, my background in just rolling open in front of everybody and just the dice being the dice 
uh, started to get different and, and the players and then started to distrust the, the, the game master when they rolled well, or right. they rolled hot for a whole session. It's like, are you kidding me? This is your fourth natural 20 game master. And we're not even having fun anymore. You're beating the shit out of us. Like there were times when it got to that point where it was like in like, I've been in that situation as the game master and as the player where like, I felt so bad for how hot I was rolling. And then the fact that there was a screen in front of me or between me and the players created more distrust. And it was like, yeah. oh crap, this sucks. In VTTs, you can open roll. You know, you can, yeah. you can, you know, audit it a little bit more, you know, well in front of your players. And I'm not saying you have to open roll. I like mystery and stuff like that. I like when, you know, two players are do engaging in PVP deception or stealth and something, and they're both secretly whispering their roles to the DM. Like, that's super cool. Um, all this to say is you got to look at why you're playing the system you're playing. Yeah. Um, and and if you are so narrative focused that you need to fudge all your rules, my advice would be try a different system. Yeah. Something that supports that type of, you know, storytelling, uh, because let's be honest, um, Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and uh, so many other, uh, you know, the game master roles. Yeah traditional you know old school you know revival games um don't support that narrative they're like they they are narrative but they don't uh kind of like put the narrative first they put the rules and mechanics yeah. first now um now the, the quick example um and quick advice if you want something that feels like D D in a lot of ways but tips the scales towards narrative where you feel like you have more control. Uh, surprise, surprise. I'm going to recommend Cypher. Um, and, and, and again, if you haven't heard episodes where we've talked about it, yeah, guess what? I'm going to talk about intrusions again really quick. Um, players have access to a version of this as well. An intrusion simply, without getting into the mechanics of it, is me as the game master saying, hey, this is going to happen, and here's some XP that has like a direct... Um, influence on on your leveling up not xp in the way that dungeons and dragons have handles it it's basically like giving them mini level ups um yeah. and so the player feels rewarded for essentially the the game master breaking the rules you know like the game yep. master gets to do something to the players or to an individual that is outside of the the base system in a way of the traditional like this happens go ahead and save to respond to it. And the player can actually say no to it. Uh, the yeah. player can, instead of receiving payment in the form of XP, they can give an XP to the game master and say, no, I don't want this to happen. Um, that is the most beautiful version of yeah. open and clear manipulation of the narrative and then rules to support it and, and yep. employing cons consent throughout the whole thing. Um, you don't get that in 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 D and D and in Cthulhu and in Pathfinder and all these traditional formatted games, and I think your players will start to see in in that kind of environment what it's like to be on the other side of the screen, if you will, to trust yeah. more and to feel like they're participating in the narrative because your players want cool shit to happen. Surprise, surprise! Yep. But they just don't want to feel cool, cheated. Yeah. Exactly. Taking away player agency, right, is is what that often comes down to. Yeah. Like if if you if you are basically making these concrete decisions behind the game master screen, right, with your roles and you've decided, well, you know, this guy actually has more H like way more HP or like, oh, yeah. this guy, um, you know, just rolled a natural 20 on the sorcerer, right? You take away from your player's accomplishments, you take mm -hmm. away from your player's agency, and it becomes more of, like, less of a game and more of just you telling the story of how, like, this is how it's happened, this is how you beat it. You, good job. 
Yeah. Um, and that's that's when it becomes like it becomes a problem quickly. Um, your players want to play a game with you, mm -hmm. right? They want there to be a challenge. They want there to be you know cool successes. They want the dice to tell the story. Yes, you can see them getting visually frustrated at the table when they're having a bad night of rolling. I can promise you that does not mean they're not having fun. It I've been can. there. It can. But then but you like, talk here's about the thing. it. But then you talk about it and you you go back to it and you're like, yeah, man. Oh, I can't believe all, you know, that entire round of combat. All I got were, you know, sub five rolls yeah. and like so many natural ones. Um, but like against all odds, we did it that's yep. that's uh that's the point of the game and so with so, cypher system you 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 get to you get to fully give that player agency over to your players and i love that uh it's i'm gonna read a section out of uh one of my new uh toys so i recently purchased uh rune cairn and uh it is the like remastered edition um phenomenal book like just read it if you're a game master uh get it it's super helpful it, it has a lot it has a lot of the old school vibes to it with um you know a healthy injection of a more of a modern perspective on on games and stuff um but in the very beginning of this book there's a section that's just called the overview and it talks about in two sentences what is rune cairn and then it gets into design philosophy um i'm not going to read each of these but it's like neutrality classless death fiction first growth like it's talking about each of these very high level design concepts that they're going to employ throughout this entire book and then the last two is player choice and principles i'm going to read player choice for you a player should always understand the reasons behind the choices they've made and information about potential risks should be provided freely freely and frequently. Um, let's see. And then principles, the warden and an adventurer each have guidelines that help foster a specific play experience defined by critical thinking, exploration, and emergent narrative. So what the book does up front is basically addresses they they should be in control of their character and they yeah. should be able to help drive this forward with the warden which is the game master um also later on it it very clearly says information and it did say right there information should be freely given right so this goes back to when you want to fudge in favor of the players maybe reconsider some of how you're running the game or what game you're running okay classic example perception DJ, I think you know where I'm going with this. If you're asking me what's in the room and I ask for a check and I need you to know that information or I want you yep. to know that information, I shouldn't ask for a role. Like, right. also, if you're a badass, like, uh, ranger or something and I'm asking for a measly perception check to notice that there is a glowing magic sword inside of the coffin that you yep. just opened i'm a bad game master because that's yeah. rude if i want you to have it it makes sense that you would perceive it there yeah. shouldn't be a role right you know if there's a, a a bloody note you know stabbed into the door um i'm gonna notice it you're gonna notice it it's you're it's not gonna be like oh that's a weird bit of decor and just move on and I think this this is, um, so there were definitely times, there still probably are times, and I'm way more comfortable with it now, where a player says, I want to do this thing. Uh, let's use the ranger, but let's change the example. Um, like, hey, I want to go like out into the woods and I want to grab some herbs and like make a little pulse disc because we just got burned. Like, I'm not really, like, you know, expecting to, like, get anything crazy out of it. But, like, that's that feels like what my character would do. It's like, great. Um, You could ask for perception checks, investigation, nature checks, Survival. all that stuff. Yeah. But why do they want to do it? They're role-playing. Yeah. They're, they're trying to get into the character. And they're already level four or whatever. They're already good at yep. this. 
so much so that they have a class level, right? They're not, yeah. they're not a commoner. They know how to do stuff. They're heroes. They're engaging in D&D most likely. This is a power fantasy. Don't limit them from picking up sticks in brambles yep. and crap out of the woods just to put it and do something cool that makes them feel like they're playing their character well. That, th this, that's yeah. the kind of problem that you run into when you become the arbiter of the rules and fun and making decisions for the players without being engaged in the conversation. So what I, I feel like players go is like, do I really need to roll for that? I remember yeah. hearing that early on and being like, yep, you do. Just because like I, I think I was engaging in the, um, honestly, power trip of, of being in charge of my friends. Like just yeah. to say it what it is. Don't be that guy. Yeah. I, I So back to that example you just gave of like finding things in the woods. I actually have had that happen recently where a player was like, hey, can I go and, you know, find, um, I, I can't remember what it was. They wanted to craft something. Um, and can I go and, you know, I know the woods pretty well. And I was like, yeah, uh, give me a roll. And I want, I, and I told, I told her, I was like, I want it to be clear. You are going to find things. Yeah. That is this not is why I'm asking for the role. The role is to determine the quality and how much of what you find. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's it. And so, uh, you know, she rolled really well, got some, uh, uh, it was components for something, right? Mm -hmm. And it was like, there you go. You, you've got it. You can make the, the health potions, right? Um, because, you know, here's the thing. A lot of Dungeons & Dragons is still centered around, like, gold. Yeah. Um, and like, just it's all it's a from the original Dungeons and Dragons thing where it's like, oh, gold is everything. Gold is leveling up. Gold is, I hate that. Um, yep. because like you know, uh, wizards need so much gold, right? Um, and other people need they so much gold. They technically need components usually. So right. Well, and, and, unless they have spell you know, focus, uh, I know that's focus, not the point. Yeah, but um. Absolutely, right? And yeah. it's annoying because, like, oh, I've recently had a lot of wizards who actually scribe their spells. Yeah. Right? They it's actually so go, expensive. hey, are there are there spell scrolls? And I was like, oh, yeah, I can I can easily give you spell scrolls. I need, oh, but I need gold. I'm like, oh, I have to be thinking about giving you gold, too. Yeah. How about this? Instead, I give you components for making those. Yeah up to a certain amount of gold and it's just easier that way that yeah. way they don't have to dive into the party gold and stuff but sure. to find those things is often a role and it's just how much are you gonna find of it cool you yep. found it awesome you did the thing that you are trained to do Ooh, yeah crazy and okay surprise surprise i'm gonna talk about nuance um this whole conversation is to say there's different styles of play there's different forms of play there's different games there's different ways to play the different games duh the D, we're talking about the default of D&D, &D, right? There's a there's a Dark Sun survival version of D&D &D where you're managing resources. Every single, like, copper piece matters. Like, that's fun. That is its own version of fun. But what did yeah. the players opt into is really what it comes down to. And making sure, uh, I won't name names here, but that you're not pretending like you know better than the players. You know, there was a certain video that got grilled on TikTok that was really just assuming so much within so much arrogance that they just know better. And you don't. You're you you might do this for a living even and be a professional yeah. dungeon master. You still don't know what's in people's heads. And it is not okay to make that assumption without engaging in some degree of consent like you have to have those conversations um especially as like a professional game master right somebody who gets paid to run games my superpower is not knowing what my players want right it is instead listening to my players and reacting to what they tell me right i I'm not I, I just I'm just not bold enough to 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 say that I've I've got it all figured out and I know the full and secret crabby patty patty formula. Exactly. I think that um again we're we're abstracting this conversation away from just dice fudging 
because I think it's so much bigger and really about just your table. It's all related. But um, like even in a previous episode, how I've talked about how I handle like floating narrative and how I run a campaign. Um, man, like I had like a trickster deity in, in Shattered Magic, one of the campaigns that we ran for a long time, time where like he would become NPCs and like give them cursed items or, or whatever, right? And I was, I had engaged with one of our players, Will, been on the podcast before, and him and I basically talked about, like, I'm I'm going to gaslight you with this NPC. Not me as a dungeon master, but I am going to be doing things that makes your character question their sanity, what's real, what's their god, yeah. even about, like, all this stuff. And I was messing with that character. I wasn't messing with the player. And right. that was fun. And I think a lot of dungeon masters find a moment like that where they feel like they pulled one over and it was so cool and they saw the player love it and they think that that makes it okay. And right. and you have to understand wh wh what are you engaging with and at what level? And like, I love taking a narrative for a campaign and keeping things undefined. And then when the players come up with a way cooler theory for how all of this stuff connects, I just go, yep, that's how it is. That's fine. That's its own thing. Like that's that is the act of improv. That's the part of yeah. emergent narrative that is really fun. Um, but even that, like, if a player straight up asked you, "Hey, did did you really always plan that to be that way?" Let's say you engaged in time travel. Never done that before. Um, and there, okay, there was a moment in Tome, our long running campaign, where we had an open and honest conversation about time travel. Yeah. And what does time we travel knew mean? we already had done it. And I said to the players, I do not want to have defined whether or not we're in a different reality or if we're in this and that, I want you guys to describe what you think feels logical and what feels like you've opted into, because I can't pretend like, well, yeah, you guys always went there and you sent that message to yourself. But the players came up with that, and that was their consent. They're like saying, yes, an alternate version of me went and did this thing already, sent me this message, and therefore this all makes sense. I could have pretended like I planned that whole thing. And, and it really wouldn't make sense for me to have done that. Right. But instead, the players felt like they earned it. And I think that that was a far more fair and fun way to have that conversation because I wasn't tricking you guys. Right. Yeah, you just straight up, right? And it comes down to what we said in the beginning, where a lot of this, a lot of these um, decisions as a game master come down to just having an honest conversation with your players, picking up, you know, the consent checklist, you know, of what they're cool with and what they're not cool with, and just respecting that the players know what they don't want. Yeah. Right? as much as what they want yeah um because in the end if your players are having fun and they're happy with how you are running the game and you're being transparent about it you're doing a good job yeah and that is that is all you need to do and in running uh, this yeah. game is hard man when you're getting started it can be really hard and you're like, yeah. you're managing feeling like you're responsible for the fun of the players at the table. And to a degree, of course you are, but you are not the end all be all like no, decider of the not. fun. And you're not the person that really is going to determine whether or not they had fun. Um, so take that pressure off. Right. And then also recognize that, yes, this is hard and you don't, you're not always going to make the right call. That's why we're talking about just talking to your players. Um, you're not a magician is really what I would right. I would come back to at the end of all of this. You should not try, it, you know, a magician never reveals their secrets. Like, that's not the game we're playing, you know? And unless you've talked about that and they want yeah. that, you know, there are definitely times where players are like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I want to, I want the mystery there. I don't care if you fudge their health. I don't want to know. That was dope. Okay, then that's your tape. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, that that's to say, I think we've pretty much beat this thing to death, and I I think that you know there are so many ways to play these games that we love. 
We care about telling good stories. Um, my short version is, is, is look at other systems if you're feeling confined by d fudging dice and, and look at other ways to talk to your players and yeah. have fun. Um, DJ, any final thoughts? Uh, final thought. Uh, yes. If, if you're a new game master starting out, recognize that it is okay uh to go through all of the canon events that a game master goes through yep uh you're going to uh you're going to over plan you're going to overwork it you're going to want things to turn out a very specific way and then uh, they're not going know, to just know that you've made it once you've reached that spot where you run a session and it feels like the players told the story for yeah, you yeah that's good well thank you all for being here with us today and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, uh, quick, quick uh, other thing that's not an us promotion thing. Please check out uh, TTRPGs for Palestine right now. You can get like 400 oh, yeah. games. Um, I just picked it up. It, yeah, it's like uh, 643 games for only $10 right now. And it goes yeah. to a great cause, uh, medical aid for Palestinians. Um, and uh, there's also like, uh, I think they might be working with Operation Olive Branch and a bunch of other stuff. Okay, in short, there's so many fucking good games in this. Yeah. Um, there's Fist. There's oh man, I don't have my my short list of these. Hey, there's there's so many games. Fist is super cool. Yeah. It's like a like a paranormal mercenary role playing game. It it's worth it just for that game. To be completely honest, that's one I've been wanting to play for a long time. Um, there's there's hundreds of creators that have contributed to this. There's likely a game that you've been wanting to play that's in here. Please check it out. It's an amazing cause. If you still want to help us out, check us out on Patreon. Um, DJ, what am I missing? OneShotStavern.com, so you can find all of our socials and, of course, uh, the Patreon that was just mentioned, uh, as well as some of our personal links. Uh, maybe some you want to hire me for a game, uh, the hop on, find my profile, hire us. Uh, if you want to become a Game Master for Hire, we got a link for that. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, we get paid. If yeah. you sign up for start playing games, also and, if you want to start a uh, podcast, uh, if you want to start a sign podcast, up premium like Podbean, which is what we use for publishing all our yeah. stuff, we um, pay for that too. And uh, we don't usually get paid for stuff, and so that would be amazing. And we love you guys. Thank you for listening. Yeah. This has been One Shots Tavern. I've been Andrew. I'm DJ. See you soon.